they galloped on and reached the graveyard. The man began digging a hole while the woman stood by. When the hole was so deep that the man couldn't see over the edge, the woman took off her clothes and hung them upon a cross nearby. She herself ran to the pastor and told him the story. Meanwhile, the dead man tried to grab his wife into his arms, but cried out, Aye, aye, it's hard. He realized she had tricked him and ran after her to the pastor's. There he yelled, Mrah, give me what's mine. The pastor took the wedding ring off the woman's finger, placed it round the poker, heated both of them red hot in the stove, and offered the ring to the ghost through the crack of the door. The dead man snatched the ring and disappeared with such a noise and thunder that the jams and chimney ends of the pastor's house came crashing down. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I'm Ian. Today I'm talking to you about William Bascom's The Forms of Folklore, Prose Narratives. This is, uh, I want to say on one hand that this is an old-fashioned article. This is from way, way back in 1965. But in many ways, it is sort of the most recent old-fashioned article. Bascom was an anthropologist and, was, and an influential folklorist. But when I want to make that distinction is that he very much thought that folklore was basically uh, a subset of anthropology where anthropology uh, that was properly concerned with verbal art and maybe he'd concede song uh, and ballads particularly as opposed to song song or, or music. Uh, but everything else was the domain of anthropology. So he, he was sort of important but in a strange way peripheral. But you know, um, he wrote a couple of very influential articles, many of which have been challenged, but in a way what they did is it's a bit of a straw man argument in that he, he set up these sort of grand sweeping statements which uh, need to be addressed. They are strong enough that uh, they set the tone of the argument. It's only subsequently that they realize, okay, well, they are old-fashioned or selective in, in, in the data that they, they choose. So this is not, uh, this, sets, this is a good place to begin. It's always good to sort of begin with a model that is perhaps a little too simple, a little uh, more basic than one wants, but to at least frame the parameters of the question and then realize that the model is m far muddier than that. So, uh, but basically, he's suggesting that folklore, the, the st what, the, what people call folklorists, call folklore, uh, can be divided into three large categories of prose narrative. He uses prose narrative as opposed to tale, because tale is, just gets confusing, because Tale is also a term that is used as one of the subcategories. So he divides it, he uses prose narrative and divides it into three. Folk tale, myth, and legend. Uh, and just a quick aside, uh, he's specifying prose as opposed to verse. And it's a good thing to bear in mind that even though one can look at the narrative structure of narrative verse, and see how the stories contained within um, are um, structured in a way that is analogous to the ways that they are uh, structured in prose. The thing about verse, the thing about uh, the structure on the very uh, level of the words and meter and rhythms and rhymes themselves indicates just an additional second order of how things are combined. Um, so verse is, uh, uh, one of the things about verse is that it contains within it, or at least a pattern is contained within it that uh, anticipates how, uh, how things are going to, f uh, what words are going to follow. So if, you're, if you've set up a, a rhythm like iambic pentameter or uh, blues ballad, you know, 12 bar blues formula, uh, 
or limerick for that matter. Not many narrative limericks, but uh, there you go. Uh, you are limited into what words are, you are going to employ. Of course, there's massive amount of creativity that, that goes in there. But the, the thing about verse that differentiates it from prose is that because it has that structure, it is more memorable. Uh, it is there, it is, uh, there's less spontaneity and there's less, uh, more than anything, more than spontaneity, there's less liberty of expressing something differently from iteration to iteration. It's not the variation doesn't happen. It's not like, um, it, it, it's not that, uh, it's rife with consistency, but it, it, lends itself to greater consistency. So one of the interesting things about ballad, which we don't study in this course, but just as an aside, ballad is narrative verse. And one of the things about ballad is that they tend to be, uh, betray older forms in part because they're not as, they're not as subject to variation as prose is. You, you still need to have, uh, fill the number of syllables and you have to have the uh, uh, you have to have the the woman's name that rhymes with the verb that you want to use so uh, in uh, was it uh, in Charlottetown where I was born there was a young maid dwelling made every man say well away her name was Barbara Ellen her name's Barbara Ellen because it rhymes well with dwelling. And the whole the whole song is basically variations on things that rhyme with Ellen. And because there's only so few things, so many things that rhyme with Ellen, uh, you're going to like, oh, that's the one I got to use. Oh, that's the one I got to use. Oh, that's the one I got to use. If you didn't have to rhyme with Ellen, you got a lot more freedom. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about prose. Um, so this first category is the folk tale and folk tales are fundamentally not true but they're not true in the in the way that a falsehood is not true they're not true in the way that a piece of fiction is not true folk tales are not purporting to be history uh, the events that happened within them are not meant to be events that happened in the real world um, and they are understood, uh, they're understood within that framework. They're understood as entertainments, basically. There's many uh, additional uses and functions of a folktale beyond entertainment, but entertainment is one of those modes. It, it, it's, it's, it's not giving us information about the real world as it is. That being said, folk tales uh, operate, the characters in folk tales operate in a way that sounds very true to the cultures in which they, they work. They, now, magic can happen and frogs can be talking, but hard work is rewarded. Beauty is expressed in a way that is commensurate with the way we understand beauty. Thrift or whatever values that are present within a group are often present within their folktales. Conversely, you want it. that's why folktales got used early on as a way of inculcating values in the young because there's that sort of reciprocity between a culture and the stories that, that it tells. So you can use these as ways of developing these virtues. Or so the 19th century would have when they basically invented children's literature out of taking folktales from the raw and manipulating them. Well, is that fair to say? Yeah, it's fair to say. Manipulating them, making them more genteel in order to express something like a national character. And uh, that's about all I have to say about that. So they, they are not communicating facts, but they might be nevertheless speaking certain cultural truths. Myths, on the other hand, as the, the name might not suggest because of how we typically understand myth in this culture, myths are understood within the groups in which they are told as fundamentally true. They, they relate a sacred history. They relate events that did actually happen despite how extraordinary that they 
uh, that they are. It could, it's, they're often the uh, intercession of extraordinary beings into the natural world. And so it's things like the intercession of the divine, the creation of landscape, um, the beginnings of, of prophet traditions, or even less um, uh, r religious type narratives. Uh, and more historical narratives that are about extraordinary events, like we might speak of the, uh, the myth of the American founding fathers, where those things that the stories are relating, they're, they're based in, in actual historical events, verifiable historical events, but the story takes on this level of import, this level of existential weight that... Um, Fundamentally, one goes into the narrative and one goes into the performance context of the narrative as if to suggest that had these events not happened, you and I would fundamentally not be here. It, they are indisputable. To, to challenge these events becomes um, anathema to the group. So they have that level of intensity associated with them. Um, and so we can talk about religious stories in, in uh, Northern European culture, in you know, uh, European uh, religious culture. Uh, most of our myths have been um, committed to text. So we have scripture, uh, whether we're talking about the, uh, uh, the Tanakh or the Quran or, or the, old or the, old, uh, the New Testament or the Book of Mormon, or whatever whatever we might be uh, referring to, uh, we, we commit them to text. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't retell them. We, will, uh, I mean, we might defer to the original voice of the text, but when, uh, when someone is retelling a parable or retelling a creation story, uh, they are using their own words. They have the check of the text but they are re-expressing something and it is being told as fundamentally true in the same way. So it's not only those things that are committed to text and that, that, confines the, the, that, that comprises the, the extent of the, uh, all the versions that we think of when we think about uh, Western myth. But uh, it's also the retellings of those stories because they're still told with that same level of, of import. Um, and then legends again, for Bascom, they kind of fall halfway in between in that they're not as existential as myths are. And he, he usually, I mean, when he talks about myths, he talks about stories that happen basically almost in primordial times, whereas I'm already challenging him and talking about like modern myths, or at least modern in terms of things that happened within the historical record because they take on the, the, the level of import that they might as well be understood within myths because they're incontestable. Legends are, at the very least, they take place within a time that is recognizably like our own, and it doesn't deal with the same amount of intercessionary beings, although legends often will talk about um, the paranormal or, uh, uh, or other forms of the uncanny, and so, Ghosts, hauntings, Draculas, uh, all, all constitute part of sort of the legend cycle, but also contemporary legends uh, and uh, uh, and you know similar forms like that. Uh, things that are that strike us as odd and strike us as as um, uh, at the very least narrative worthy. Uh, and he says that these are things. And he's still using that sort of old formula that that they are understood as true. And the problem with that formulation, yeah, but you know, they are understood as true by the tellers. And the problem with that formulation is that it's it kind of has implicit the idea that they are understood as true by the tellers, but clearly they are not. And so it it really privileges the uh, the folklorist in terms of how they are interpreting narrative. Uh, con in, in nowadays, legend is far more nuanced than that because legend has to do much more with the, um, the, the uh, things that operate. Uh, the, the narratives deal with things that uh, are 
counter to the way that we expect the world to operate. So there's often these things that we live in cultures that have a certain morality associated with them and kinds of issues of safety and issues of progress. And then, you know, contemporary legends are often about fear of the other and discord and uh, intent to harm. Uh, we, do, we understand the world as rational and, and scientific. And then, you know, we also deal, and then legends have to do with things like the, uh, uh, the supernatural and, and, and the paranormal. And so it's like, I, I cannot explain this. I, I choose rationality whenever I can, and yet these anomalous events happen. And so legend kind of falls in between. Another way of distinguishing a legend from myth and tale is that myth and tale are both public performances. Basically, the teller has uh, some kind of right to perform. The, uh, for example, again, with, with myth, it's usually an elder. And even again, when we're talking about our own, uh, about uh, North American, you know, Christian, Judeo-Christian uh, people of the book culture, um, even if we're talking about literally reading from a text, only privileged people are allowed to read from the text in public forums. Um, tale, on the other hand, tale is often like, as it enters into a community, problematic expression, I know, but it becomes one of, usually the, it becomes associated with one particular person's repertoire, a person who has a reputation for narrative fluency. And because they are not contested, Myths aren't contested because they're fundamentally true. Fairy tales, tales aren't contested because they are fundamentally fiction. It's like contesting it is beyond the point. It's like, no, it's a story. Shut up. Uh, legends are all about contestation. So but because myth is incontestable, because fairy tales are incontestable, they are sort of public performances where, that, where the, uh, the, the listener sort of sits back and goes, ah, I'm being told a story and isn't this great? They listen intently and, you know, they are active participants in as much as they are active rec receivers to it. But it is much more a public, almost a top-down performance. Legends are typically much more private, much more intimate, because they deal with uncertainties. You know, Did you hear about this thing? And so they, they're, they're sort of much more side to side. And they're not orated from, from a public podium. Now, the thing to grasp is that these are fluid categories. One of the things we might notice about myth, uh, and we won't necessarily say that or d say this in sacred contexts, is that myths are often a lot like fairy tales on a structural basis and that they have to do with a, an unlikely hero who goes through a number of paces and is, is uh, ultimately proves, you know, fa you know, faces some kind of uh, challenges and is ultimately proven to be uh, of a particular elevated status. So, um, so even though they aren't contested, uh, the, they're understood as fundamentally true, um, they, nevertheless, they have a sort of fairy tale quality about them. And that's when we also enter into the idea of when we, we hit that sort of weird section in the, you know, like when Northrop Fry talks about uh, the Bible as literature and so on. Then we look at these, we, we structure them as tales, even when we're understanding them as true. We can nevertheless analyze them on the, on the, using the same tools that we use to analyze uh, any other texts because they are story and typically they are oral tales and so are, 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 are go that way. And we have things like, um, we have better, or not better, but we have, at least we have uh, less uh, third rail examples like, um, the Greek myths, where, you know, I don't think perhaps there's sort of neo-paganism that has re-emerged and is, re is trying to reinvigorate belief practices in the Greek myths. But for the most part, we're not, um, uh, th we're not telling them because they are our gods and they're incontestable. We're telling them because they're good stories. And so they have moved, they've shifted categories around. And legends the same way. I mean, legends have become these sort of incontestable things until they kind of... Uh, uh, their their challenge disappears, and then they they might become uh, something else. They might become something like anecdote or parable or some other category. So already, we're seeing. I mean, and he talks about this. He he talks about this in a number of places uh, that these categories are slightly fuzzy. Uh, 
Yes. So one of the things about um, uh, things shifting category is he says this at the bottom of page seven. In passing from one society to another through diffusion, a myth or legend may be accepted without being believed, thus becoming a folktale in the borrowing society. And the reverse may also happen. It is entirely possible that the same tale type may be a folktale in one society, a legend in a second society, and a myth in a third. Furthermore, in the course of time, fewer and fewer members of a society may believe in a myth, and especially in a period of rapid cultural change, an entire belief system and its mythology can be discredited. Even in cultural isolation, there may be some skeptics who do not accept the traditional belief system. And this boils down to those, like the various charts that he has created in order to uh, understand his thing. So uh, in the first chart, his, his version of it, uh, where he's distinguishing myth, legend, and folktale uh, uh, as a form, and then on the basis of belief, fact, fact, and fiction, respectively, in time, uh, the remote past, the recent past, and any time, as in a sort of a time outside of time. Uh, in a place, a different world, uh, an other world, or an earlier world, which is basically what we're talking about when we talk about myth. Uh, in legend, the world of today, or at least the world that is a recognizably uh, historically related to today. So something like uh, bah, 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 um, like a Robin Hood legend or so on. It's not meant to take place today, but it's meant to take place at the very least within uh, a non-magical time. Maybe that's a way of thinking of it. The attitude towards them, a myth is sacred, legend is sacred or secular, folktale is secular. And uh, the principal characters are non-human, human, human and uh, human or non-human, uh, so it's a it's a little bit uh, a little bit peculiar. So I adapted this chart, which helps a little bit, and uh, at the very least, I think it nuances what he's talking about, where where the belief, the instead of fact, fact, and fiction, it's um, fundamentally true, open to negotiation, and fiction, where time. The time of them is some, some kind of primordial history. Uh, legend takes place in some recognizable history and folktale again in some time outside of time where the, the setting is more or less irrelevant. Um, the place with a different world, other or earlier. Uh, legend is in the world of today. I think I kept, I kept these more or less in place. Uh, and you know, folktale, place outside of place. Attitude. Um, where he had sacred, sacred or secular, and secular. I have sacred, dialectic, and moot, where the attitude towards them, it doesn't, for a folktale, in a way, it doesn't really matter because, you know, it, it, because it's understood as story. Uh, whereas legend is entirely about dialectics. It's entirely about trying to discern between the truth or falsity of something. And then the principal character is supposed to non human, it's extraordinary beings. So again, like Founding Fathers uh, operates in that way as well. Uh, legend, they're, they're human uh, for the most part. I guess the occasional ghost will throw in there. Uh, and then folktale, it's human or non-human. He farts around and talks about uh, anecdotes and jokes. Uh, it was an interesting category. And again, we, we, uh, um, he doesn't know exactly what to do with them. And the fact that he doesn't know exactly what to do with them and they mess up his nice system uh, seems to say something about that nice system. 10 years after this, we have people like uh, Sandra Stahl writing about personal experience narrative and basically blowing him out of the water uh, by uh, eliminating the boundaries of what is the proper object of folklore study and what is not. And then he has an, a lovely chart again on page six, which is interesting for him. It's sort of this uh, uh, way of being able to untangle a, a legend uh, or a, a prose narrative. And so he you know, begins with, you got this narrative and then check, 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 and you work your way down. And it's like, oh, well, if you hit this point, it's a myth. It's like a, it's like a BuzzFeed, uh, BuzzFeed quiz. Uh, if you hit this, you're at myth. If you hit this, you're at legend. If you hit this, you're at, uh, at folktale. Uh, it's not the greatest flowchart in the world, but it's a good faith effort. Uh, he doesn't really talk too much about who has the rights to tell stories. There's a, 
there's a, a little bit sort of floating around on it. Uh, he doesn't talk much about the attitude of audiences, uh, the, uh, the attitude of uh, how an audience might affect um, a, a particular flow of narrative. And it's, it's a little bit uh, wonky. And also, he, sometimes he doesn't talk about the, the, the context that well, where he's heard, you know, he, he'll say about certain stories that can only be told after dark. And uh, he doesn't really explain or give much in the way of a rationalization of those. And, um, uh, and yeah, so he gives lots of examples. And let this be uh, a lesson in that uh, how to selectively skim an article. Because from pages 8 to 15, there's lots of examples. And it's basically, it's, those examples are illustrative. And they're also serving to help him justify why he thinks in this particular way. Um, and basically the whole argument is that scholars have identified similar categories in a broad swathe of cultures, enough so that he is confident enough to say that uh, the definitions can be meaningfully applied even to societies in which somewhat different distinctions between prose narratives are recognized. So he's more or less steamrolling his way through and saying, these things work, these are good categories to work with, and even if a culture doesn't have them, uh, we know what we're t if we use them and we use them appropriately, we know what we're talking about. He's, he's almost angry at this generation that he sees coming up behind him. And it's kind of fun to watch. So he's making one last bold effort at establishing once and for all a fixed vocabulary, um, which... Is useful. It's useful because it's a lot of people would have dismissed Bascom, and in one way it's rightly so. But as I said at the beginning, you kind of want to begin with the easier model, the, the oversimplified model, uh, in order to grasp these things before you introduce the complexities. And a good example, a good parallel, is that when you're in high school, they're still teaching Newtonian physics. They don't teach Einsteinian physics, unless things have changed since I was in high school. Because you really need to know Newton and, and that kind of fixed ordered universe before you can see how Einstein blew it apart. So you kind of need to read Bascom, this last great effort at articulating a thought about here's how we can classify narrative once and for all. And uh, before you start reading all the people who more or less start tearing it to shreds, because you need to know what they were tearing to shreds. So this is, a, it's a very useful reading. He wants to, and he, it's good that he is trying to bring an international perspective. He recognizes that these words, they come from European categorizations. And so his examples are very much drawn from an international, uh, from, um, an, an, an international sampling from, from Africa, from uh, First Nations, from uh, Southeast, uh, South Pacific, uh, a whole host of different critical studies, massive collections in the history of the anthropological approach to folk narrative, saying this isn't just some weird European thing, these terms work. And it's like, okay, sorta they do. Um, but it's a good place to start. It's a good place to start for the reasons I just gave, because it's nice to have the vocabulary uh, that people were dealing with when they started challenging the vocabulary. Uh, here's another analogy that works. You know the way that high school French and French don't sound anything alike, but you need to learn high school French in order to sort of get the mechanics, and then when you get into the real world, at least you can make yourself understood, and then you realize how much of it you need to change. So today we've talked about physics, and we have talked about French. Now we have talked about William Bascom's forms of folklore, prose narratives.
it's uh, useful. I don't know if it's good, but it's important. Yeah. Be well, my friends.